archive. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, as you just heard, this webinar is being recorded um, and will be available in about a week or so on our YouTube page. So if you miss something or um, you wanna rewatch it, you can absolutely do that. Um, so of course, this is the October forum. And today we are going to be discussing landscaping for water quality improvement uh, with Ray Wolf. And before we get started, I do have a couple announcements here. Um, so first of all, if you're not familiar with Partners of Scott County Watersheds, we are a nonprofit organization um, based here in Scott County, focused on improving the health of our watersheds and reducing flooding. Um, and one of the ways that we do that, of course, is through education with forums like these. We also do workshops. Um, we have many volunteer opportunities throughout the year, and we provide technical guidance in a number of ways as well. Um, so we're actually going to be discussing um, in our next forum the water quality monitoring events that we do that kind of ties into both the education uh, and the volunteer opportunities. So we'll be discussing the results of all the data that we've collected. Um, so do join us for that one. It should be very interesting. We'll get to learn about what's going on in our communities um, and what we can do about it. And of course, we can't do this without our partners. Uh, there's many of them, and we are very appreciative for all their help um, for us to be able to do these kinds of opportunities. And if you're interested in becoming um, a partner or a member, we have many options for that as well. Um, the, they are all listed out and um, explained further on our website. So you can just look us up, partners of scottcountywatersheds.org. Um, and join us in our efforts to have healthy waters. And finally, we have some free nitrogen test strips available from Iowa Corn. So if you're interested in getting these um, sent to you or having a partner's representative come to your site and help you analyze these tests, conduct them, um, and take a look at what's going on, we are absolutely happy to do that. Just send us an email and we can get that sorted out. So I believe that's all my announcements here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, stop sharing and turn it over to Ray, who is going to begin our presentation. Um, as we go along, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A um, box at the bottom of your screen. We'll be answering the questions towards the end of the presentation. Um, and I believe that's all I've got, Ray, it's all you. All right, I um, have the screen here. Thank you for the introduction, Kelsey. Oh, Ray, we can't hear you. Can you hear now? Yes, we can. All right. There. And is the slide back? Nope, not yet. Sorry, folks, if you give it to us just a minute, you know how technology goes. There, is that better? We can hear, but we can't see your slides quite yet. Hmm. Try again.
All right, Ray, we can see your screen, but we still can't hear you. I'm not sure what's up. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Let's, uh... Uh, seems when I go to uh, share screen, I lose the sound. Ray, Ray, there should be an option when you go to share to make sure that you're using the sound. So just make sure that all of those options are selected when you're selecting that. All right. All right, where are we at now? think we got it. All right. Apologies for that uh, technology. You would think the number of presentations I've given since this COVID thing, I'd be a master of it, but apparently not. Well, to give a little background, uh, my weather service side of my experience uh, has me well versed on the rainfall issues we're facing around our part of the world, including the increase in in total rainfall and heavy precipitation events, which is certainly part of the water quality issue. But also I've been a Scott County Master Gardener for over 20 years and have put into practice many of the things uh, that we'll be talking about in the next few minutes. So to get specific, we probably, if we could flash back to our middle school science classes, learned about the hydrologic cycle. And specifically for this, presentation, I'm going to point to the area that's circled in red, because that's the part of the equation that we're really most concerned about. Uh, and that's how water infiltrates uh, into the soil, becomes soil moisture for our plants to use, and then uh, flows through to inner flow or, or through flow uh, into groundwater and then into our, our rivers and, and streams. And the runoff component of the equation is what ideally we want to minimize uh, or manage to the degree we possibly can. So if we look at frequency of, of 24 hour precipitation events, I actually put this together. Golly, this graph is probably now 15 years old. So things have definitely changed since then. But the point being that uh, a sizable number of our precipitation events are on the lighter side, uh, which makes them pretty easy to manage in a home landscape. Now, we are seeing more of the one inch plus type amounts. Uh, and, and the heavier the rain amounts get, the more challenging it is to manage within our home landscapes. Yet there are still some things we can do to improve our resilience there. If we take a look at a big picture and how our climate is changing, uh, these little postage stamps of the United States show the normal amount of rainfall relative to the 20th century average. And this is in 30 year blocks. That's what we use for our normal reference. And on the graphic, your tan and brown colors are drier than the 20th century average and your green areas are wetter than the 20th century average. And if we take a look, starting in the early 1900s in the upper left and ending in 2020 in the lower right, we see a huge amount of green. 
So our precipitation is most definitely increasing. The climate is wetter today than it was uh, 20, 30, 40, and 100 years ago. And so this is something we have to deal with. And some of that rain is coming uh, in the form of heavy rainfall events too. So what have we seen on the climate change, sort of the background we're looking at, uh, and we've seen it right here at home on the Mississippi, increased flooding, but ironically also increased drought. And that's kind of counterintuitive, uh, understandably, but 2019 was a perfect example of how we were dealing with flooding and, and the issues related to planting season for farmers in the spring. And then toward the end of the summer, things turned really dry and we actually got into moderate drought conditions here in the area. And then the fall flipped back wet again. So uh, what's really changing is the distribution and amounts of rainfall that we're seeing. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in the harmful algal blooms, uh, not only in ponds, uh, but also rivers and streams. And even there's just a new story out, they're starting to see these in Lake Superior, which is just crazy because that lake is uh, usually the temperatures are, are so cold to not support those type of events, but the lake has warmed uh, to where habs are now problematic up there too. So the key is how our soil and water interacts. And what we wanna do in our yard is to improve water infiltration and also improve water holding capacity of our soil. And by doing this, we improve the resilience of our home landscapes while simultaneously uh, improving water quality. Some of the things that can be done uh, deep tillage, I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Increase organic matter and an increase in plant diversity I'll show on upcoming slides. Uh, the deep tillage is kind of a one-time thing. If you're building a new house, uh, I had a cohort who uh, built a new house out in Walcott and before he put his yard in, he got a tractor in there with, a, with uh, deep tines and basically ripped through all the compact soil from all the equipment that was used to build the house and uh, really broke that up and then went in and planted his yard uh, using some of the techniques that I'll, I'll show here. And uh, I wish I had the picture from him. I couldn't get it unfortunately, but he's got a picture of a heavy rain event. And after uh, the rain had ended, and things had started to dry out, he took a picture of his curb and his curb was totally dry. Whereas the neighbor who did not perform that deep tillage still had water running out the yard. So that was an indication that he indeed has improved the infiltration of water into the soil uh, and that decreases the runoff, but also makes that water available for the plants in his yard. One way to improve, uh, improve infiltration into your soils is through aeration. Uh, and I know the county used to have the program uh, a few years back where you could do the deep aeration and then follow with compost. And in fact, that's, uh, I've done the regular aeration and then had compost put on instead of traditional chemical fertilizer. Uh, but the idea with keeping the soils well aerated, especially in areas where clay is, is so dominant, is that the water, the fertilizer, your compost, and oxygen get deeper in the soil and promote better root growth deeper into the soil zone. It's also important to do a soil test to see where your nutrient balance is, whether you're looking at say a vegetable garden, for example, or, or even your turf, because the local soils here tend to be high in phosphorus. And that's a, a part of winterizers uh, is an additional amount of phosphorus to help promote root growth uh, because it's the, the roots really that overwinter and get our lawns a quick start come next spring. But our soils, 
tend to be uh, naturally high in phosphorus. So I've found through the soil test that the winterizer for me is actually a waste of money. I'm putting phosphorus on that I don't need and just a, a standard application in the fall to uh, get things set up to uh, go next spring is, is plenty good. Uh, increasing organic matter. We're lucky here with the Davenport compost facility. Uh, it's a wonderful resource we have. Uh, anytime I put new beds in my house, uh, I put in a heavy dose of concrete. I have a pretty uh, solid clay soil out here in Parkview, especially on the slopes. You can see the spreader there uh, that you can rent from the compost center to spread that on your lawn in lieu of regular fertilizer. And that's what I actually have a, a young man who started up a, a business based on these conservation approaches. And I put uh, four treatments of compost on a year instead of the traditional four uh, chemical and in, in fertilizer treatments. Uh, so I'm really limiting my chemical use, uh, the non-fertilizer chemicals, and just focusing on growing a healthy lawn uh, that infiltrates. I also uh, mulch when I mow and, and have mulched for the 25 some odd years I've been here in Parkview, even using a mower that wasn't designed as a mulching mower. And, and this is quite a change in culture from when I was growing up as a, a kid in suburban Chicago mowing our lawn. Uh, I have the steel garbage can there because we used to bag. And every week I would fill up two of those cans and then have to haul them out to the curb and then they come by and pick them up and off to the, to the dump, garbage dump. Uh, and in hindsight, what a huge waste that was, especially because we're paying to fertilize. So we're harvesting a crop and not even getting any money for it. So uh, the idea is that uh, keep the grass clippings on your lawn. I've never had a, a thatch problem, even when I've not been as aggressive with aeration as I have been lately and it just makes things a lot easier. You're not filling the landfill with grass clippings. The only time I'll actually pull clippings off my lawn is to use as mulch in my uh, garden. Another uh, little bit that's not well known, uh, you know, a lot of folks and understandably so like to cut their turf short and get that golf course look. Uh, but actually if you mow at about three inches, the root depth of the turf is roughly proportional to the height of the grass. And that's what you really want to maximize your root development uh, depth wise in your soil because that provides access to uh, more water. So during times of drought, like we've seen uh, this summer, uh, your lawn can be a little more resilient and uh, withstand the droughts at least up, up to a degree. Now this one might be a little more controversial, but uh, I would say consider diversity in your turf. Again, uh, folks seem culturally to focus on the monocrop and it's just gotta be the grass and, and nothing else, but you look at the clover there on the left and look at that root system, that tap root uh, goes much deeper in the soil than the turf roots. So you're accessing uh, moisture and fertility farther down. The clover also fixes nitrogen that the turf can take advantage of. And at the same time, the flowers uh, the white clover flowers are great for pollinators, especially uh, honeybees I've seen in my yard. Now, there are other plants that you could consider in a, a diversity perspective. Uh, dandelions might be a, a, a bit of a challenge to justify that to the neighbors as to why you're 
you're letting those go. Uh, and I do uh, select dandelions out of my yard component because the, I look at them as an invasive species. They're not uh, native to the US. They came over from, from Europe and I'd rather have the pollinators out there pollinating the native plants. Uh, another option is violets and I have a part of the yard that I'm experimenting with this. Uh, the violets in the context of the turf stay pretty small, but you see a few flowers there again, they're pollinators and that enjoy that. And there's also uh, a group of butterflies that depend on violets as part of their life cycle. So the yard is every bit with the clover and the violets is every bit as soft and useful as a you know, a place for kids to play or to get the lawn chairs out or whatnot. And uh, if you can get past the culture of a monocrop, uh, arguably the, the turf looks every bit as good and is just as healthy as the monocrop. Ideally, it's also good to limit chemical use. The more you limit chem chemical use, the less likely there is obviously to be runoff into our waterways. And there are two easy options there. One is hand removal, especially with the little dandelion fork there. Uh, but spot spraying, I, I have it for years. I, I've not bought any fertilizers that contain any other chemical pesticides, nothing on grubs, uh, nothing on broadleaf weaves, nothing on crabgrass. Uh, rather, if I feel compelled that I have to spray, I'll spot spray. And, and this is where, you know, just like a, a teaspoon of chemical mixed in with the water can cover the issues I have in my entire yard, maybe even sometimes with a little, a little extra. So you can really limit the amount of chemicals you put on, which narrows uh, issues with potential runoff. Rain gardens is, is another proactive means of, of managing water uh, on your lot. This especially works well if you have a slope. Uh, and I do in, in my backyard, it slopes down to a creek that's a little farther out from the house. Uh, but years ago, before I even knew what rain gardens were, uh, I had this one part of the yard where uh, after heavy rains, it would stay wet and I'd have to slog the mower through to cut the grass. And that got, that got kind of tiresome after a while. So I thought, well, I could just pull the turf out and put in a flower bed and find some natives and, and non-native plants that actually like the wetness uh, and put them in and let the water collect and let the plants use up uh, that water. And you see with the deep rooting system, that allows the rainwater and the runoff to uh, percolate much deeper into the soil. And then they're pulling uh, fertility out from a deeper profile of the soil as well. So again, a more resilient, drought resilient uh, and heavy rain resilient uh, setting uh, you can do by developing a rain garden. Now, what I did quite by accident actually can be uh, engineered in, in a more aggressive manner to be even more effective probably than what I've set up. But uh, the idea is with the rain garden, again, to make full use of your soil profile as a way to uh, mitigate uh, the amount of runoff that leaves your home. And here's kind of a, a schematic of how one can do that. And again, it helps having, having slope uh, from your house so that the water will run off into these. And a well-designed rain garden will only hold water for a day or two or maybe three. Uh, so you're really not going to get into issues with mosquitoes or, or things like that. Now the question becomes, uh, what what kind of plants to put in there and what will it look like and what will 
neighbors think. And that's where I pull out these pictures from the rain garden in my backyard. Uh, you see a broad diversity of, of different kinds of plants. Uh, some are natives, some are non-natives, some are native ours, that is uh, plants that are related to local natives but have been selectively bred by horticulturalists for, for different traits. Uh, so I find having a spot in my yard like this to be much more interesting than turf. And at the same time, it's uh, serving a useful purpose toward improving water quality and quantity. Here's a picture from the fall, actually on the left, just taken a couple weeks back. So by selecting a range of plants, you can have interest uh, year round, even with the grasses, uh, even interest going into the winter time. Some other pictures from the other side of my yard, you can mix in. It doesn't have to be all herbaceous perennials. You can mix in trees and shrubs as well uh, to really add a lot of interest in, in some structure to the yard. And actually, given the slope in my yard, it slopes away from the house into the backyard and out in Parkview, uh, beyond those flowers there is actually community green space. So these flower beds also serve as kind of a, a soft fencing in addition to capturing uh, a runoff that comes from my slope. Rain barrels are handy. They're a way to kind of uh, modulate the flow uh, and, and help through dry periods too. Uh, the best rain barrels are those that are a closed system because then you don't have any, any issues with uh, mosquitoes or whatnot. And there are all sorts of resources online about how big of a rain barrel to get and, and how to hook them up. But basically by modulating uh, the water, you're taking away some of the runoff during the heavier rain events and keeping that water available for when things uh, are drier. Uh, rain barrels are not flood prevention devices. We're not going to change the level of the Mississippi River by installing rain barrels across the Midwest, but locally we can reduce runoff and have a positive impact on water quality. All of this is about letting the soil do its job biologically to meter out some of the, uh, the chemicals and whatnot in our yards before they get into our waterways. Rain barrels come in various sizes and prices, 50 to 75 gallons and, and $50 or up. Again, the closed system kind of addresses the mosquito issues and uh, the algal issues as well. There are some alternatives here, and this is, uh, I found an old wash tub and filled it with soil, and, and this is kind of an interesting uh, approach here. You can see the downspout actually comes in to the, uh, into the wash tub and feeds the deciduous plant there that's right in the middle. The evergreen around it is actually growing in the ground. It's not in the pot. So the evergreen hides the pot so you can't see it. And then uh, that's a Virginia sweet spire plant right in the middle there. Uh, and I chose that one because in the fall, you'll see it right. That's the kind of color I'm going to get out of it in a couple of weeks here. Uh, it is a water loving plant and uh, actually is probably one of the better places in my yard for it because it has a more reliable supply of uh, water, even in that confined tub because of the tie in to the downspout and uh, capturing the runoff uh, from my roof. So another more uh, structurally hefty approach is green roofs. And this might 
not be too practical necessarily for for our homes. I do know folks who have put up sheds in their yard and have green roof them. Uh, the picture on the left is actually on top of City Hall in Chicago, where they have a full-blown prairie uh, growing up there. And that's in the, in the foreground is actually Rattlesnake Master. Uh, and the benefits in the urban areas, uh, this basically, it reduces runoff because of the, of the capture uh, by the soil on top of the roof. Uh, it also serves as thermal insulation to the building. And I would argue if you're living in a, a condo or apartment downtown, I would much rather look at green space like this uh, than a black asphalt or, or rocked roof. Uh, some other examples in the lower right there is the, uh, the uh, community center over in Coralville. You can actually see it off of Interstate 80 on the, in the north side of the interstate there near the, uh, the Coralville Mall exit. And then in the upper right is from the Davenport Police Department in the green roof that uh, they've installed on their facility. So with that, I'll kind of wrap up and hopefully you've seen some ideas on practical things you can do in your yard, uh, things that don't necessarily require a huge dollar investment and things that can have a, a positive impact on the quality of water leaving uh, our lots. And just a reminder that uh, winter truly is around the corner. So I nabbed this picture of a bristlecone pine up in my front yard with a dusting of snow on it. It might be several weeks before we see snow around here, hopefully, but I assure you it is coming. And with that, I'll take any questions. All right, well, we'll give folks a minute to enter any questions um, have it in the Q&A box. Um, but while we give people a minute, uh, personally, Ray, I would like to hear more about the closed system you talked about with the rain barrel. Um, can you talk about, you know, the closed versus open system with that and, and what that looks like? Yep, I think that's where your your water feed is fits snugly, uh, links to right into the barrel uh, so that there's no way for, say, mosquitoes to get in. And then at the bottom, you have a, a spigot to let the water out and there's a overflow device. It's surprising how little water it takes if you have a good expansive roof of how quickly you can generate a barrel full of water. Uh, yeah, great, well, thank you for explaining that. Yeah. Not seeing any questions yet, but again, we'll give folks some more time. Um, Ray, could you talk about perhaps how you, I guess you, you discussed um, kind of when you first started putting the plants in your yard, but what got you interested in doing that um, in the first place or um, becoming a master gardener? Well, it's, uh, I mean, ever since I was a kid growing up, I was kind of the yard keeper in our, our home in suburban Chicago and uh, is really a, a pretty boring thing. I mean, we had turf, we had silver maples, which are the worst tree in the world to have on your home lot. Uh, and we had yews and junipers. And that was the 1950s, 1960s uh, landscape architecture palette for suburban Chicago. If there are any Chicagoans out there or folks that have relatives there, that's what everybody had. And it was pretty boring and uh, didn't consider uh, any gardening, uh, any local food production, you know, on your lot. So, uh, and then moving to different parts of the country. I've lived and gardened in Mississippi, in Colorado, 
uh, getting exposed to different kinds of plants and things down there. It just sort of grew from that. And of course, Scott County is one of the initial master gardener programs in the U.S. It has a long and rich history here in the county and connecting with those folks uh, was really, uh, I would encourage anybody who has an interest in gardening to take a look at the master gardener program that Iowa State runs uh, as, as it's very, very well done. And, and having those sorts of resources to me brings uh, more enjoyment to gardening and managing the yard and the flip side is my, my job, I spend a lot of time with people and computers and sitting down. So being able to come home and get outside and work in the yard is a, there's a physical and mental health benefit there too. Awesome, thanks for explaining that, Ray. Um, we've had a few questions come in. We have one, um, should people be looking for plants that are more drought resistant due to the changing climate? Yep, that's a good question. And I would say uh, certainly yes. And that's the great thing about selecting natives. Uh, the natives have been here. Uh, they are genetically programmed to deal with extremes of dryness and wetness. Now the balance between those is changing uh, but the idea of a plant with deep roots being able to survive uh, drought or being able to deal with extreme wetness is, is still is still there. Uh, so the, the natives are, are really a, a great angle toward building resistance with plants in your yard. Awesome. Thanks. Um, another question we have here is how much compost do you use per square foot in place of fertilizer? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, because I hire it done, I don't know what the rate is that is put on. I do know uh, it has a, 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 a greater impact and uh, longer lasting impact than when I was using uh, the typical chemical pelleted fertilizers. Uh, but the thing is, you're also working the biology of the soil at the same time. And that's important. Uh, you're building essentially an ecosystem uh, with your turf. And diversity within the ecosystem uh, from soil biology to the plant diversity is what increases your resilience and improves your soil quality. Awesome. Uh, kind of related to this topic, uh, someone asked, what about using compost in a spreader four times a year? That again works better slash in lieu of traditional four times a year bond programs. Yep, and that's what I've done. I'm in my second year of that, and uh, looking at my lawn the last two years has has never looked so good consistently through the season, uh, even with the drought. Now it, it did suffer from the drought. In fact, uh, usually my rule of thumb is if we don't get decent rain for about six weeks, then I become concerned, even with these practices, about losing the turf. So I was just about getting ready to start watering when we got some decent rains and the lawn has recovered nicely uh, with the rains we've had. And I have one more uh, fertilizer application coming shortly. And if we can keep the uh, weather on the somewhat mild side, your turf roots will continue growing as long as the soil temperature is above 50 degrees. So even if it cools off, you know, into the 60s, uh, that turf will still keep keep growing. So there are times to beef up the lawn uh, to get it ready for next spring. Awesome. Um, another question here. I want to establish a rain garden where my sump pump discharges. It can stay wet several days after a good rain. Should I look into different plants than a typical rain garden? 
No, I think that's that's exactly a, a great example of taking a problem area and turning it into a positive. So, uh, though since the plants that one selects for a rain garden are used to the wetness, uh, that'll work right into that spot. Perfect. Um, I see just a few more in here. Um, what are the biggest hurdles that you see to shifting the public opinion that turf is the only way to go to have a yard? Uh, well, for me, uh, it was just doing it. And I have, if folks are familiar with Parkview, we have these green spaces that are actually in our backyard. And I have folks walking by all the time and make comments on how nice it looks. And I suspect uh, if all I had was turf, it could be, you know, it could look as good as Glens Creek Golf Course, but I don't think people are gonna comment on how nice my yard looks just because the turf is perfect. So uh, I think the biggest thing is, is to do it uh, I go heavy on flowers, or if you're doing a seed mix on, on the Forbes, so you get a lot of color. People will connect more quickly, I think, with the flowers, whereas the grasses, uh, which really are quite beautiful in their own right, but it, it's more of a subtle beauty and maybe for some a little bit more of an uh, acquired taste. But I know some of the colors you get out of the little blue stem and, and big blue stem for example, are, are really pretty neat, especially in the fall. Okay. Certainly. All right, well, I don't see any more questions. Um, I think we've answered all that have come in. And again, if anyone has questions, um, Ray did have his email there, or you can contact partners and we can I'll funnel your question to him. And again, we thank you all for joining us today for this forum. Hope you learned a lot and have a great rest of your day. Thanks folks. And thanks, Kelsey.